Okay, so for this chapter on nutrition in humans, uh, we'll be talking about how the digestive system works and at the same time, absorption and the functions of the liver with respect to uh, aiding uh, human uh, digestion. Okay, so for digestion, why do we actually need to take nutrients in in the previous chapter and of course your enzymes? Is that nutrition is the process in which organisms are able to obtain food and energy for growth, repair and maintenance of the body. So generally, this is what uh, nutrition, uh, the, the value of having nutrition in the human digestive system. These are the key processes involved in nutrition. You have ingestion. So ingestion is uh, where the food is actually taken into the body uh, through the mouth. And subsequently, uh, what happens is along the alimentary canal, uh, you actually will undergo digestion. Uh. So some of these large food molecules are then broken down into smaller soluble molecules. So there's two keywords over here we are looking at. Number one is smaller and the other one is uh, soluble. So it's because of these two keywords, right, where we, uh, uh, why is it then important? It's because smaller means uh, size change. But it has to also be small enough such that it is able to dissolve into water and then subsequently absorb into your other digestive processes so that's one then of course because of the digestion there comes with the absorption and assimilation where these food particles digested food molecules right are then absorbed into the cell these food molecules are also converted into new protoplasm or even used to provide energy ingestion is then you have undigested food that is removed from the body as waste material so this is an outline of the human uh, elementary canal where the human elementary canal represents the different uh, represents all the organs also associated to it and they are all involved in digestion in one way or another. One common exam question is they will give you an, uh, a blank diagram of this and you are required to actually label the parts. Okay, so the ones that are highlighted are the main ones that are commonly tested in exam that you will need to know. So like in the mouth you have the um, salivary amylase that uh, the salivary gland that will produce salivary amylase which is an enzyme to break down starch to maltose okay you have the oesophagus which is like uh, in primary school you learn it as the gutlet that will transport food down into the stomach which is very acidic and later on you have protein digestion the liver will produce um, your bowel that will be stored in your gallbladder which will eventually be secreted into your small intestine for emulsification, which is to break down large fat molecules into smaller fat globules. For your enzymes, they are created by your pancreas to help to digest it into smaller, more soluble pieces. So mm -hmm. generally, in the small intestine, you will also have the reabsorption of water. That's the first point of uh, absorption of water that takes place. And of course, the large intestine, remaining water is being absorbed. Okay, uh, there is generally no much digestion in the large intestine and most of it happens in the small intestine. Subsequently, all these feces are stored in the rectum before it's being released into the anus. I mean, out of the anus. So the mouth, or in other words, the buccal cavity, right? It's where food will enter the, uh, the, the body. And uh, in this case, the mouth is just an opening, while the buccal cavity is actually the whole thing within your mouth. And inside the buccal cavity, you have your teeth and your salivary glands that will then produce uh, enzymes or to help to grind your food down into smaller pieces so that you can actually digest the food better. Um, there are two main forms of uh, digestion that's occurring here. They are your physical digestion and your chemical digestion. Physical digestion comes in when the teeth actually grinds it into smaller pieces to increase the surface area for your salivary amylase to act on it. <laughs> The phallex actually connects the buccal cavity to the oesophagus and the uh, linex, which is the voice box. And it also leads to the trachea. Now, the intent of this is mainly to be able to separate the, the food into two separate uh, uh, vessels, which is either your windpipe or actually into your, uh, into your stomach, so as to prevent any form of choking from happening. Okay, and of course, uh, this is actually a part of both the digestive system and the respiratory system. 
So if both of the food and air must pass through um, to the enter the oesophagus from the tract, how is it then prevented to, you know, like to prevent the food from falling to the respiratory system or your lungs? Is this following reaction where your lilacs, right, has a slight opening called the glottis and it is covered by a flat like tissue known as the epiglottis. So during breathing, air will actually travel to the trachea and the lynx will actually move downwards with the glottis actually open. And then during swallowing, what we could see is that the, the lynx will actually move upwards and the os epiglottis will actually cover the glottis preventing food particles from entering into the trachea. So you can see this is how it actually works. Next, we move into the oesophagus, where in the oesophagus, this is actually a narrow muscular tube that will be able to extend to the stomach. So the wall of the oesophagus is made up of two main layers of muscles, the longitudinal and your circular muscles. Okay, so your circular muscles are muscles to surround the vessel. Of the oesophagus, while your longitudinal muscles will actually align it. It's the length kind of muscles. So both of it will actually uh, contract and relax to push the foot down, which we'll go through later on. The stomach is actually the next one, which is it is actually an indispensable, uh, intensible uh, muscular bag. And the food in the stomach is digested by the gastric juice that is secreted by the gastric glands. So with this in mind, what will happen is uh, the food will get churned, digested, and broken down, okay, providing an acidic medium. The small intestine is the next part where the food will pass from the stomach to the small intestine. And the small intestines will consist of the dodrinum, the jorginum, and the ileum. This is about 6 meter long in, in an adult, and hence will allow you to have enough time to pass through to all parts of the body. The large intestine, on the other hand, leads to the, uh, the small intestine, on the, uh, but then eventually lead to the large intestine as it consists of the colon and the rectum, and this is about 1.5 meter long in length. So what are the organs associated with the gut? You have the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, which all aids in the digestion of food in the gut. So the gallbladder tends to store bowel temporary, while the liver is made up of the high lobes, the cell of the liver secretes the bowel. So the bowel helps to emulsify fats into smaller fat globules. This is not an example of digestion. Because digestion involves a chemical reaction with an uh, enzyme cycle. Well, while bowel is not an enzyme, it's just a chemical to help to speed up the rate of digestion by chopping your fat molecules into smaller fat molecules. Uh, the fats will still be in its inert, uh, uh, intended um, uh, there is actually no chemical change to it, so it's still the same. It's just that it's chopped off into smaller pieces. And then, of course, the pancreas will also secrete your pancreatic juice, which can help in digesting the food, and these are your enzymes. Uh. So what is peristalsis? This is also another common uh, exam definition that you need to know, where it is the rhythmic wave-like muscular contraction in the walls of the elementary canal. Rhythmic because it is continuous, like a wave. Okay. And this, uh, and when we talk about muscular contraction, uh, because it involves both the longitudinal muscles as well as the circular muscles. So both of these muscles in the oesophagus are antagonistic in nature. And it helps the, the movement of the foot along the gut generally push the foot downwards. And it also enables the foot to be mixed with the digestive juice. So antagonistic muscles are, contract, uh, are muscles that actually oppose one another. What this means is when one contract, the other would relax and vice versa. So in exam, my suggestion is you have to present both scenarios where when the circular muscles contract, the longitudinal muscles in the wall of the uh, gut will actually uh, relax. So when circular contracts, longitudinal relax, this will then push foot towards the inner side of the uh, or down the oesophagus. And when we have the circular muscles to contract, this will actually constrict the oesophagus. Whereas when it relax, it tends to dilate the whole oesophagus. Okay. So over here, we could see that 
the circular muscles will actually contract and the longitudinal muscles will relax in this region here. And this will and over here the walls will dilate when the longitudinal muscles will contract, circular muscles will relax so as to widen to allow the foot to actually enter. So this is dilation. Okay. Next we move to digestion in humans where there is two main types of digestion. We have the physical digestion and chemical digestion. So for physical digestion, right, it tends to involve mechanical breakup of food into smaller pieces. This is done either by chewing or by peristalsis. Okay, so these are the two main items. For chemical digestion, this involves the breakdown of large molecules in food into small soluble molecules that can then sub be subsequently absorbed. There is also the involvement of hydrolytic reactions that helps to catalyze the digestive and that is catalyzed by the digestive enzymes. So it begins with the mouth, huh? whereby first you eat the food and that the chewing action of these teeth will help to break down the larger pieces into smaller pieces. This in a way is an example of a physical digestion which helps to increase the surface area to volume ratio for enzymes to actually react to it or act on it. And this is where the salivary glands in the mouth will secrete saliva. And this saliva is usually mixed with the food by the tongue. So inside the saliva, it contains the mucin that softens the food and salivary amylase to help to digest starch into maltose. This can be shown in their reaction over here. So what we usually do is we tend to write conventionally the enzymes on top of the arrow and the food that we take, which is starch at the front, and the end product after digestion at the end, which is maltose. So uh, after this has been done, the tongue will then roll the food into small, slippery, round masses, what we should call boli, or bolus for singular. So in the osophagus, there is generally no digestion unless it contains the enzyme from the mouth. But most of the time, there uh, in your syllabus, just take it that there's no uh, digestion except physical digestion because peristalsis occur in the oesophagus. So with the help of the gravity, the, it will then slowly push the bolus into the stomach. So in the stomach, the bolus will then enter the, uh, the sorry. So when the bolus enters into the stomach, it will cause a stimulation or the release of your gastric juice by your gastric glands. Peristalsis in the wall of the stomach will then mix with the food with the uh, gastric juices. So generally you could see that over here it tends to be very acidic. And, over, and what we do usually take note over here is uh, why is it acidic? It's because of the hydrochloric acid that is secreted by the stomach. Okay. So why is the gastric juice? They are hydrochloric acid mucus and the enzyme pepsin. Now pepsin right uh, is actually an enzyme to help to digest your protein into polypeptides. Okay, your hydrochloric acid will then denature or break down your glucose uh, salivary amylase. The, the better word is called denature. And hence, this will actually stop all digestion of starch or your carbohydrates, at least in the stomach. The enzyme will also convert an inactive enzyme, which is in the form of pepsinogen, into pepsin, which is the active form of the enzyme before it can actually act on the protein. It, it produces an acidic medium to, pre, to provide optimum condition for the enzyme to work on and it kills all your micro, harmful microorganisms in foods. So in terms of the action of the pepsin, the food will remain in the stomach for about three to four hours. And, the, and this particularly digested food, which is known as now chime, will then pass into the nodinum when the Splinter will actually relax and slowly move on into the small intestine. So in the small intestine, uh, chime will then enter into the duodenum to stimulate the release of your pancreatic juice. And your pancreatic juice are the ones that contain your enzymes. Uh, your bowel, which is not an enzyme, but what it does, it helps to emulsify fats into small fat globules. So from very big molecules of fats become smaller molecules of fats. So that at your intestinal juice, by the small intestine, it will contain the enzyme to break down your fats. Okay, so in the small intestine, it's so special because everything is broken down in the small intestine. Your three nutrients group, your protein, your carbohydrates, as well as your fats. 
So the alkaline fluids will also help to neutralize the acidic medium. And that this is needed for the action of your enzymes, both from the intestines as well as from the pancreas. So in the small intestine, one very important thing you need to take note is that bile is produced in the liver. However, bile is stored in the gallbladder. A lot of students tend to mix up that bile is usually produced in the gallbladder and that's wrong. Okay, it's mainly produced in the liver and stored in the gallbladder. So in the event that your liver bile functions, right, can fat still be digested? Yes, it can. It's just that it's happening at a slower pace. The gallbladder will then release its bowel and pass through the bowel duct into the duodenum, and the pancreas will actually secrete pancreatic juice, which will then contain the enzyme. So the pancreatic amylase, the pancreatic lipase, as well as the trypsin will all be involved in the digestion in the small intestine. Uh, the intestinal juice will also secrete other enzymes like maltase, sucrase, lactase, peptidase, intestinal lipase, and this will help to digest the food. Is there a need to memorize all this? All this can be derived from the name of the uh, molecule that they want to digest. It's like maltase digests maltose, sucrase digests sucrose, lactase digests lactose. So these three are actually your carbohydrates. Your polypeptides, your peptides, your peptidase are the ones that digest your protein. Your intestinal lipase is the one that digests your fats. Trypsin digests your protein, amylase produce your carbohydrates, and lipase digest your fats. So what we can see is um, all these groups, right, they tend to be broken down to smaller pieces by your enzymes. And uh, like what I shared with you just now, these are the ones that you need to know for your enzymes, whereby starch is broken down by two types of amylase. Salivary amylase happens in the mouth and intestinal amylase or pancreatic, uh, we, uh, sorry, not intestinal, but pancreatic amylase by the small intestine. Okay, and uh, yeah, so these are the ones, take note. Okay, uh, and then eventually the end product being digested are usually simple sugar, like for example, your glucose, your fructose, and galactose. Okay, and you will see that in the, your carbohydrates only happen in the mouth and small intestine. You don't really see carbohydrate digestion in the pro in the stomach. Whereas on the other hand, in the stomach you will see more of protein digestion only, and in the small intestine you will actually also see protein digested. For fats, it only happens in the small intestine. That is why for fats, um, they tend to actually get the help from bowel to help to emulsify it into smaller pieces, so that they. When they are actually broken down, it break it down into small fat globules. They will then be suspended in the water, and this is eventually followed by the digestion of fats. So fats can be digested by your lipase into fatty acids and glycerol, which are the end products of fats. Now I'll be moving on to adsorption, where one very key important uh, organ that usually talks about adsorption is your small intestine. Now, a very common exam question is asking you to describe how the rate of adsorption is being influenced. And this generally, are, um, there are three main factors that help to affect the rate of adsorption. They are number one, your surface area. Number two, the thickness of the separating membrane. And number three, the concentration gradient. So having a larger surface area allows more exposure of it to actually absorb the materials. Having a thin separating membrane will reduce the distance between the two media to allow quicker transfer of the molecule. And finally, a steep concentration gradient because most of this is done by either diffusion or osmosis or even active transport. Therefore, you need a very steep concentration gradient in order for the rate to actually be faster. So how is then the small intestine adapted for Adsorption. This one is another type of uh, essay or follow-up essay question that came from the previous one, whereby the small intestine has about a few layers of uh, increasing the surface area to volume ratio for adsorption. First of all, we have the V-line, which is the inner wall of the small intestine. And you will realize that actually all of these have already one form of uh, extension of of increasing the surface area. And within it, 
each of these small small protrusion right these are what we call the feline and they will actually further increase the surface area to volume ratio for absorption within the cell wall or the, the membrane wall of this thing you will actually find microvilli which will also have an extension of the large and uh, uh that, that uh, large protrusion to further increase or enhance the surface area to volume ratio so we could see that this is one key thing in which the small intestine could be adapted for uh, absorption, for fast absorption. Other areas are like, for example, having very thin walls of the villi to ensure that the nutrients are passed on through to the bloodstream easily because there's lesser resistance. The length of the small intestine is long, so there has to increase the time for absorption rather than having it too fast. Too fast for the, for the food to pass away from the small intestine gives it the lesser uh, efficiency in absorbing your nutrients. Finally, there are a lot of blood capillaries located around the villus, and this will actually help to always maintain a steep concentration gradient in terms of uh, taking in the food and then transferring it away. So it helps to maintain that relationship. A common question will be given like this picture, and you are required to identify which are the areas to transport part. So your uh, your lacteal or your lymphatic capillary helps to transport fats to the body. Okay, this is actually found as the yellow color component of the small intestine. And then you have the blood capillaries, the one in red and blue, that will be responsible to transport amino acids and glucose to the body. So these are some of the items to take note. Do understand that the lacteal doesn't transport fatty acids and glycerol. It actually transports fats whereas your blood capillary transport both your amino acids and your glucose to the rest of the body this is done by the uh, the process of diffusion or active transport which we have already went through during the uh, earlier chapters of movement of substances so by, by diffusion right glucose and amino acid were diffused into the blood capillary whereas for glycerol and fatty acids well they diffuse into the epithelium they will then combine to form small, mini, mean small, fat globules, which will then enter the lacteal capillary. Sometimes if we do fasting and what's not, you can also, we can also still absorb all this glucose and amino acid by active transport. For any of the undigested food materials, they are generally unabsorbed and they are stored temporarily in the rectum and discharge the species through the anus. So this discharging of feces from the body is what we know as ingestion. So ingestion means we take food into the body, the IN, and ingestion is like exiting, so it, it gets removed out from the body. There is no chemical uh, process for this because the waste material will come out from the body as it is. Okay, I will move on to talk about the transport assimilation of the absorbed nutrients, but do take a look at the first few chapters uh, take some time to digest it and uh, I will I'll see you